Good morning. You may be able, if you look real close, to find a seat. Good to see each of you here this morning. Because if just a few of you hadn't showed up, I'd been here by myself. But I'm glad that you did. It's on the 4th of July. And we worship the Lord on the 4th of July. So when it falls on Sunday, just like we do any other day. We're in Luke chapter 7. Lucas capitulo, I forgot how to say seven, David. I meant, uh, yeah, that's right. Let me get where I'm supposed to be. Just a minute. 18 through 35, and we'd come down to about verses 29 and 30. Luke 7, verses 29 and 30. Let me just pick up there and read through the end of, uh, uh, till we get down to the parable of the debtors. Um, well, let's see. Before I do that, we need to have a word of prayer. Yeah, that'll be right. Would you bow with me, please? Lord, we're thankful for the day and for the opportunity to be together. We're thankful that we live in a nation that affords us the freedom to assemble. We pray that it may ever be such. That we are concerned with things that we see taking place in our nation. We pray that you will help us to have the, the courage and the fortitude, the fortitude and the determination uh, to remain a faithful remnant, regardless of what men do. Help us always to recognize that we want to support every righteous thing that our government attempts, but to recognize that salvation is not found in governments of men, for they are flawed creatures like we. We pray that you bless our study this morning. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Let me pick that up about, let me see. And when all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. To what then shall I compare the men of this generation and uh, what they're like? They're like children who sit in the marketplace to call one another and they say, we played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge and you didn't weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine and you say he is a de has a demon. The son of man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her children. Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who this is, uh, would know what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, uh, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, Say it, teacher. In verses 29 and 30, the Lord uh, po points out uh, very, very graphically uh, the difference in attitude to, of the ordinary Jew and the Jewish leaders towards his preaching, and, and, and specifically toward the preaching of John the Baptist. When the common people and the publicans and the outcasts heard John, readily heard him, they justified God. What uh, That is to say, they acknowledged before God that they were guilty, that they were worthy of condemnation, and that he was uh, completely justified in demanding from them uh, that they confess their sins and truly repent, not in word only, but outwardly and publicly by undergoing the baptism of John. Uh, they, they, they said, God is right. And on the part of the Lord, 
But then, of course, this, this interaction between them serves uh, to indicate that he forgives those that will repent and turn away from their sins. The Pharisees and the lawyers, however, didn't respond that way, did they? Oh, no, they didn't, they didn't need to repent in, in their mind. And they mostly refused to be baptized. And they thus rejected uh, the counsel of God concerning them. And so to their own undoing, they made his plan of redemption worthless so far as they themselves were concerned. You know, you can't, um, you can't just um, lift a high haughty head and get by with that in terms of uh, dealing with our Lord. He's not going to accept that. And so they've, they've got their own system, and they're going to hold to their system, and they're not going to accept any correct, correction from anybody else because they're better than everybody else in their own mind. They're smarter than everybody else. You know, if you have to be very careful. Uh, no doubt the Pharisees did a lot of very positive, positive and productive things. They had a lot to do with the copying of Scripture and the preservation of Scripture, and uh, we likely would not have large portions uh, of Scripture if it were not for the efforts of the men that came to be known as the Pharisees. But, uh, you know, it shows where it's possible to start out right and end up wrong. Uh, you can start out uh, with a noble intention, but you have to watch your attitude. And, um, you know, we're, we're in a society that is uh, growing more antagonistic by the day to people of faith. And uh, that's an unfortunate thing, and we want to maintain, just pray that we would maintain status as a righteous remnant if that's what it requires. But then you cannot uh, go past that to where uh, we're, we're just so much better than, than those sinners over there and so much smarter than all these other people and that kind of thing. Uh, not only is that wrong, it's just factually incorrect, but how does that play with other people? You know, in terms of trying to convert them, you know, um, that's not a very good approach, not a very productive approach. And yet you'll, you, have, you can see it sometimes, and a person in smug arrogance will sit there feeling all superior, and uh, probably not. In verses 31 through 34, Jesus uh, gives a parable here, and, and what he's doing is indicating the nature and the quality of the Jewish leaders and other members of the people who refused to listen to him or John. And he's, he's going to illustrate that. And so they are, he says, like two groups of kids. And, of course, a lot of um, uh, similarities. You know, adults sometimes can cover up their childishness, and the child's just honest with it. But there's a lot of childishness in the affairs of men, isn't there? Or is there? I mean, you look at um, the stuff that we see back and forth, the yammer back and forth on television it's, that uh, the various uh, powers of uh, leadership central type places, it emanates from the media, it emanates from this party, from that party, from another party, but a lot of very childish kind of stuff. And so here he says, you know, these, these, uh, these Jews are like two groups of children who reproach each other because, well, you know, we, we played music for you and you didn't dance. Then we played a dirge for you and you didn't weep. And so it's kind of hard to, to please you. And, and uh, just as foolishly willful and intractable are those people who objected to John because he is a preacher of repentance, lived an ascetic lifestyle, and they objected to him and, and said he's a, a wild man and all those kinds of things. But they also objected to Jesus because he lived just like a normal person and associated even with publicans and sinners. Oh, boy, I mean, can't have a religious teacher uh, fooling around with publicans and sinners, can we? He might convert one of them. So I mean, that's just kind of, that's kind of the attitude and the mindset that uh, the religious uh, intelligentsia and the, uh, the upper crust, the elite people had allowed themselves to fall into. And so he said, you know, he shows here 
that this self self willed and reactionary generation of people didn't know what they really wanted and are dissatisfied with whatever's offered to them. I don't know if you've ever uh, encountered anything like that in contemporary American society, but there's some of that around. Uh, they don't know what they want, and it doesn't matter what you present, and you can wear yourself self out. Run into this, run into that, let's try this, let's try that, let's try something else, let's spend money over here, let's spend money over there, and yada, 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 and you can have a whole lot of busyness going on and not much Christianity happening. And so... Uh, when Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun, he got that right. He absolutely got that right. And so Jesus is trying to point out to them, and he's still making a, a play for the souls of these people. He's not just uh, uh, giving up on them in, you know, in an absolute sense. He's, he is uh, doing his very best to reach out to all of them. Whatever attitude and behavior, verse 35, may be adopted by these Jewish leaders, and others, Jesus says, wisdom is recognized and honored by all her children, whatever form she appears in. And he's personifying wisdom as a lady, and that's often done in Scripture. So she'd be recognized by her children. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter what form she comes in, whether it's a, an, an ascetic, rugged, outdoor-type man like John the Baptist, or if it's just a, a, a young carpenter and um, just regular guy like Jesus or, or anything in between. And uh, oh, later on, it'll come from a, a uh, highly educated and refined rabbinic scholar like Paul, who was converted to Christianity, began as an enemy, ends up as one of his most devout followers. Wisdom will be recognized by her children. When John the Baptist became... I began to question the Savior's methodology uh, and sends those disciples. It's, you know, we were talking about that last week to inquire. Uh, did Jesus change? Jesus didn't change his methodology at all uh, because he is the son of the very God and whatever method methodology he picks, that's the right one. He doesn't have to uh, submit that to me uh, and, and let me pass on it and decide whether or not that that'll work in Livingston. His way is his way. And, uh, and if anybody needs to change, it's humanity. John the Baptist uh, raised that question. Jesus did not change his methods, but he continued in the same way that he'd been working. And then he also expressly informed John that this and this alone is the methodology in my kingdom. Now, what a lesson that is for the church of Christ. Biblical methods of living and working uh, are criticized sometimes. And when they are criticized, we're not to compromise what the text presents, but we are to continue faithful pursuing the work that his word ordains. And we owe it to the critics to have them to understand that this and this alone is the methodology that the church intends to pursue. I remember a, a political figure some years ago uh, was standing outside factory shaking hands up in the Northeast as he was politicking, you know, uh, asking for votes. And some TV reporter said, well, you know, in North, normally in these national things that uh, the candidate doesn't come out and, and, uh, and do things like this. And he said, but I do. And, uh, and won the presidency. So the point is what Jesus does is the right thing. And the way he does it is the right way. And the emphasis needs to be where he put it. Uh, and, and we're not going to improve on that. Um, and I'm talking about central things, not peripherals. But if he emphasizes uh, uh, the death, burial, and resurrection, and they emphasize that in the preaching and teaching of the early church, it was empowered by the Holy Spirit 
men of God spake as they were carried along, you know, not of their own interpretation or their own private thoughts, but as they're carried along by the Spirit. If that's, we have a document like that, if we have that and we do, then we ought to follow that, should we, shouldn't we? Or shouldn't we? You see, because you have, if you look out there in, in the wider religious environment, you have people just kind of doing what they want to do, what we like, you know, and, and we might have a, a, a band and, you know, some drums and guitars and stuff, because I like guitar music, see. Um, or we might go a little more classical and have a flute and a violin. I like that. But is it about what Lyndall likes, see? Because what the Lord said through his apostle is to sing to one another by means of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, teaching and admonishing one another by those means. That's what he said. It's a one another activity. Everything else is passive. For the most part, you are passive in the class. You're absolutely passive during the sermon. We sing together is what we do corporately. Even when someone leads the prayer, that individual leads and everybody else follows along with, uh, with him in the prayer. So it's the one uh, group activity, if you will, where we admonish and teach and encourage one another. And if that's what he said to do, then that's what we ought to do. Uh, and, and so uh, in, in the kingdom of God, the methodology, if you want to put it under a real broad umbrella, is to show mercy uh, to those about us, especially those who are of the household of faith, and to preach the glad tidings of the kingdom. That's his methodology. And there's no recourse, for example, to compulsion. There's a reason that I don't uh, have two or three really big burly guys with lump under their jacket standing up here, you know, to uh, deliver the invitation. And there's a reason I don't have somebody walking down through the aisle when the invitation song is sung with a, with a billy stick going, you know, trying to intimidate and threaten folks. He didn't, he didn't tell us to do that. He didn't allow us to do that, does he? Uh, Jesus didn't coerce people here. He told them the truth, and he told it really plain where it could be, you know, uh, down on his old cowboy sitting on the bottom shelf where the calves can get it. But he didn't, he didn't coerce anybody. And so, uh, you know, that coercive kind of approach is still advocated in some quarters. And in some of the uh, world religions, uh, the, the jihadi, the Islamist uh, wing of, of Islam in recent years has arisen, and they openly advocate the use of violence and what have you as a, as a tool of uh, evangelism. Jesus never did that, wouldn't stand for that, and uh, we don't either. Uh, but what a, a serious charge, uh, verse 30 Gives, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. They had an opportunity to have a prominent role. I mean, who knew the prophets better than they did? Who understood the law or had the, well, I don't say understood, who had the law in their possession any more readily than they did? And they should have recognized their own Messiah before anybody else did. Instead, you have the regular folks recognized him. Wisdom is recognized by her children. They, rec they recognize John. They recognize Jesus. And then you have the people that should have been uh, leading the parade, waving his banner, and they refuse. Uh, refuse to believe the message sent by God refused to uh, accept the salvation that is offered by God. They were going to do what they wanted to do. And, uh, you know, I guess and he could take it or leave it. And what's he going to do in that kind of environment? He's going to leave it. Because we don't tell him. Verses 36 through 50, you have the story here of the sinful woman who anoints the Lord's feet. Uh, and so I wanted to read all of that together. Verses 36 through 50. Now one of the Pharisees requesting of him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Read that a minute ago, but it'll bear rereading. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner, and when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume, 
And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman who is touching him is, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. The money lender had two debtors, and one owed him 500 denarii, and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she's anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Those who are, were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Um, what a contrast. Uh, the, the attitude, the arrogance on one side, the contrition and deep penitence on the other. Thus far, Luke has, as he's been going through this gospel, has for the most part been shedding light on Jesus' progressive self-revelation of his divine power and, um, and his sympathy towards the plight of mankind and the suffering of humanity. Uh, we've seen him more and more clearly as the Messiah, as the Christ of God, the one sent, the one anointed. In this part, uh, Luke precedes his portrayal of Christ, or with his portrayal of Christ, and, and lets us see him exercising uh, his divine and redeeming love for sinners. And here again, it's evident in Luke, in his gospel, uh, he especially brings out the fact that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Um, that's why we do a lot of things we do. That's why Herschel goes out to the jail. That's why a number of the brethren continue to go out to the Polanski unit. And, you know, if, if most of you probably have not spent much time in a maximum security prison, but they have uh, ever-changing security protocols. So it, you just have to jump through hoops. And, and there's reasons for the protocols, and they can't tell you all of that. And so you just, if you're going to be out there as a guest uh, in the man's house, uh, then you're going to comply. And they do that. Why? Well, because there are people out there that need the gospel. Uh, is, do you think there's any place in Polk County that needs the gospel more? I can think of a couple of places that might out in these woods, but, uh, you know, it, it needs to be. Our, our, and our elders have really kind of anchored or are anchoring that program. Uh, that's who, He came after those people, didn't he? He cares about them. And so I can't not care about them. In fact, he cares about all of us. And so, and illustrates that here, uh, he loved Simon. He loved that Pharisee. The text says, uh, verse 36, I believe it is. Now, one of the Pharisees asking, he did specify, one translation says, now on a certain day. Uh, he doesn't indicate when, but the Lord is invited by this Pharisee to eat with him at his house. And from what follows in that narrative just read in your hearing, it is, it is readily apparent uh, that he didn't do this out of love or respect for Jesus. Uh, he did it at best out of curiosity and at worst trying to get something on him uh, so he could charge him or have him charged. Um, and, and although Jesus knew this, he went anyway. He accepted the invitation. And I think it's evident uh, from the way he, he proceeds that he accepted because he loved Simon. 
uh, and he's after this man's soul. And you see, and he's not going to—he's not going to overwhelm his ability to choose, but he's going for it. And uh, and so while they're at the table, this notoriously sinful woman, uh, who had probably, it, it appears from the language that she had recently come to understand who Jesus was and to learn it about his redeeming power and, and um, had, had uh, sought and received forgiveness, but recently. And so she hears he's there in this Pharisee's house and she comes into the house uninvited. That's not done. I mean, it is something unheard of. It's something highly, highly unusual for anybody uh, to come into anybody's house uninvited to venture there but she does that she you know she overcomes you know she's got to be at some level concerned about how she's going to be received and and whether or not she's going to be thrown out uh you know summarily thrown out but she is so contrite and so penitent because of her former uh lifestyle on the one hand and on the other hand so grateful and, and so attached to Christ, who had come as her Redeemer and her Savior, that she puts aside all her fears, and she not only enters the house, but she goes to the table where the Pharisee is entertaining his guest. And there they reclined, as you know, you've heard that explained a thousand times, around a low-slung table where it would be easy to gain access to his feet. And she kneels at his feet and begins there to anoint his feet with, uh, with perfume and to wash his feet with her tears, to dry them with her hair. Now, an alabaster box of perfume, we, it is more expensive than what you're going to buy uh, down at Neiman Marcus, you know, comparatively speaking. That, that's a high-dollar item, and, and that's a, a great honor. And to put it on his feet, uh, even more so, and so she is, is, has spared no expense to show him this act of courtesy and to honor him. And, uh, and so it was, it was easy for this woman who was, who was not named to wash his feet because of the position he was in. And then the critical Pharisee in verse 39 sees in Jesus uh, attitude towards this woman, a weakness, a flaw to his way of thinking. I mean, according to this self-righteous gentleman, uh, in his idea of a true prophet would be that he would never allow such a thing, that he would, uh, you know, he would bellow out at her and, and tell her to be gone. But, uh, you know, he, he thinks a, con, uh, a true prophet is not only going to know what kind of a sinner she is, but would avoid her for that very reason. You know, um, and in this case, you know, when Jesus says in past tense, your sins have been forgiven, apparently only recently, but sometimes when a person is trying to make the change, folks are hesitant to let them, aren't they? You know, I've always tried to remember myself and urge my brother, if somebody's trying to repent, let's let them. How about that? You know, and so... Say that she's been penitent. She is now. She continues to be penitent because no doubt regrets the the foolish choices made and the time wasted. Um, someone related to me, and I may have shared this with you that anyway, one of our relatives was uh, conducting a meeting somewhere, and a lady and he said, "Well, tell me about yourself." She said, "Well, you know, she uh, ended up." Uh, pregnant out of wedlock and, and as a kid and, and began to relate some of that. And he said, well, were you drunk or stupid? And, um, and, a, and the sister laughed because he wasn't trying to uh, let her, you know, he wasn't trying to rub her nose in it, but she said, yeah, a little bit of both, I think, you know, at the time. But she changed. She was a very different person at the time that they had that encounter and that they were talking about that. But she still felt some pain for the bad choices made. And this woman feels that. In verses 40 through 42, although Simon the Pharisee gives no utterance to his thoughts, Jesus knows what his thoughts are. He knows what's going on in that little Pharisee head. 
And so he asked him, which person is to show, uh, do you think will show the greatest love and gratitude, the one that's been forgiven much or the one that's just been forgiven a little bit? And Simon doubts the genuineness of Jesus' calling because uh, he regarded him as unable to read this woman's character. But by the question he poses to Simon, he not only read her character, he read Simon's character. Uh, I mean, he read him like a book. And so Simon has to reply, well, I suppose the one that's forgiven the most. Well, you know, steps right in to the trap uh, and uh, Jesus declares that you've answered correctly. You certainly did. And then he proceeds to make a practical application to this woman's life and to Simon's uh, situation. Uh, you know, make a practical application of what Simon himself has admitted is true uh, by pointing out that, you know, Simon neglected to show common courtesy. You know, in that culture, you don't invite a man into your house for a meal and not provide water and, and not to provide for his feet to have been clean from the road. You don't do that. I mean, it's a, a highly discourteous thing for that not to have taken place. Uh, you know how the Europeans, each other, say he offered him no kiss. He doesn't show him any respect at all. Common courtesy is not observed. And so he made it clear that he had not invited the Lord in the right spirit by his actions. And in contrast to that loveless attitude, this woman, that this sinful woman, or has been a sinful woman, but recently, showers him with exceptional uh, marks of, of respect or acts of respect and honor and affection. Therefore, Jesus says it is clear that she has experienced forgiveness of her sins, which were many. He acknowledges that. But she's in the right place. And it is because she's conscious not only of the magnitude of her sins, but also of the glorious fact that her sins are forgiven, that she acts toward him with such uh, deference and, and in such uh, contrition. And at the same time, uh, such deep esteem and affection. And so from that whole context of the story of or the parable of the children, you remember, uh, who can't be satisfied. The Savior's express statement here in verse 48 that her sins are forgiven. It's clear that the woman had already accepted the Redeemer. And probably, as I say, not long, whether, not long before whether it was in those multitudes of people that were listening to him, following him, or whether or not he'd had some encounter with her on a one-to-one -one basis and been able to teach her more, more uh, perfectly, we don't know when and where. But her touching marks of honor toward him, and, the, and the, uh, those things are the outcome of a sense of forgiveness which had already become hers. She already had that. I mean, how do you expect if any individual put yourself in that spot who comes to some understanding of the magnitude of sin. And all are guilty. None is righteous, no, not one. And if you have any uh, understanding of the magnitude of sin and the price that had to be paid that we memorialize every Lord's day, if any of that sinks in, then how do you think you might receive the Lord? Say, you know, one, uh, I would think, would be uh, forgiven to fall on his neck and to give him a hug, you know, or, or any other acceptable act of honor uh, and respect uh, that, that he could be shown. You'd think that people would want to do that. Her, her uh, display is, uh, is exactly right. But he, she demonstrates she's got it. She's understood she knows that she has been a sinner. She knows what she deserves, 
and she knows what the Lord has provided her escape from. She understands that. Verses 48 to 50, although her sins had already been forgiven, she's nevertheless still regarded by others as a notorious sinner. You know, I mean, how long does it take for somebody's uh, penitence to be accepted? It depends on the community, really, doesn't it? I told you about a long time ago, an elder in the first congregation I preached over at Bethel Springs, as straight a guy as I ever was around, ever. And that's saying a lot, because I've been around some very fine brethren. But Brother Leonard Hips, and I was out uh, beating the bushes, and uh, an old guy out there was talking about him, and he said, yeah. He said, I know about that bunch up there. Um, so I know you elders, Brother Johnny Plunk, Brother Leonard Hips. He said, you know, it's an amazing thing. Y'all must have something. He said, you must have something. Because when Leonard was a young man, we were young men, he was a bootlegger. Wore a pistol on his hip. Wouldn't do the fool with very much. And I was stunned. You know? <laughs> Leonard? Uh, he said, but he, of course, this guy didn't understand clearly. He used denominational terminology. But anyway, he, he became a member of that church down there and said, I've known him for the 40 years after that. And buddy, that guy's straight. He's the real deal. So I don't know how long it took that gentleman to come to that conclusion, but he was willing. Of course, I never, ever mentioned that uh, to Brother Hibbs. Um, but he was just about as fine a guy as I ever was around. And so that's the power of the gospel. You know, that's the power of the gospel. And that can be said of a lot of folks. You know, now, of course, he wasn't one that's going to go brag about, well, I used to be a bootlegger, you know, and all that. And he wasn't that kind of man at all. Uh, he, uh, I wish y'all could have known him. He was, he was something else. He sat right on the front, always wearing a suit. Um, in the wintertime, it gets cold in Tennessee, and if he get in there and get warm, one eye would go down, and the other one would be doing that. I couldn't look at him because I, I, it was funny to me. Uh, but he wouldn't let that one eye go down. He could keep one eye open, then, no matter how sleepy he got. Uh, but he was, uh, he was a good, good man. Had always been a good man. I mean, who could that not be said of? And so this Pharisee, self-righteous Pharisee, uh, is, is missing the whole point. That's what's sad about it. Simon's got an opportunity here to see the light. And Jesus openly declares, you know, they're, they're seeing this lady one way, and he says her sins are forgiven. Can he do that? You better believe he can do that. And when those present are amazed at him making that pronouncement, he reiterated uh, his confirmation of the fact that she's become a new redeemed person. He uh, declares to her that it is through her faith that she has received forgiveness. And then in front of everybody, he says to her, go in peace. Her sins are forgiven. Uh, she is saved. He is, she has become a new person, and therefore the former despised sinner can and must depart in peace. See, she has accepted uh, that what was presented to her, no doubt the teaching of John, and, and it's operative at this point because Jesus has not yet been crucified. All real love towards Christ must be preceded by deep contrition, a consciousness of one's own sinfulness and ill-fitted nature before the Lord and by the assurance that for Jesus' sake, our sins, however great they may be, are forgiven if we come to him on his terms. Uh, when, when Isaiah was taken, transported in a vision, when he received his commission to be a prophet, and he was taken in a vision of the presence of the Lord. Did he, did he just land there and say, hey, what's up? Now, he didn't do that, did he? In fact, he was terrified by what he saw. And, and in, in his mind, he immediately saw the difference between the divine and Isaiah. Now, Isaiah is arguably probably one of the finest men alive at that time. He is a good man by human standards. But when confronted with just absolute perfection and purity and holiness, it just scared him. 
And that's when the angel came to him, you remember, and he said, I'm a man of unclean lips among such people. And he took the coal and touched him, symbolizing purification of fire. And uh, he accepted the commission. But deep contrition and recognition of where we stand in comparison to the love and the majesty of God, and then the ability to recognize that for Jesus' sake, God will forgive that. On those two things, uh, on that foundation, our salvation rests. If it doesn't, it, it is not a thing of permanency at all. We have to, you know, he is the way, the truth, and the life. We're going to talk about that this morning in a little bit. And he, he is that. And no man comes to the Father but what? But by or through him. That's an exclusive claim. Yes, it is. Uh, we're not the only persons that make an exclusive claim, but ours is justified because of who he is. And I respectfully say that. But it's not Buddha. It's not Muhammad. It's not Confucius. And it's not any number of other great teachers that have, have and, uh, come across the world. But it is Jesus of Nazareth who is the son of the very God. Um, He's the, the one who in the beginning was with God was God. The one by whom and through whom all things were made that have been made, John, uh, John's gospel says. We come to chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Soon afterwards, he began... Yes. Sure we do. It is painfully easy to fall into to Simon's place. Painfully easy because people say and do and, and give off uh, uh, aromas that are offensive. I remember one time a guy came in here, and I, I think he was telling me the absolute truth, but he he had uh, making a bike trip, and he had to fix his bike. He was out of money, and he was trying to get to Beaumont, and he had a real nice bike, and he said, I can do it by dark. And he was about to cave in. The guy was hungry, he said. And all he wanted was something to eat. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. You go down to, you like Whataburger? Oh, man, yeah. Go down to Whataburger, and I'll, I'm, I'll be, I'm right behind you. So he told me what he wanted, got it, got him a big old jug of uh, lemonade down there. Then he want, he hugged me. <laughs> now, he, this old boy's been on the road about three days, you know. I mean, I'm sure my wife smelled me when I got home, you know. <laughs> but he was... He was very grateful, and, uh, you know, I never heard any more from him and, and all. But, but like you say, it's easy, it's, it's easy in that environment to think, well, you know, he's just a bum. Uh, or you can look at it and say, well, I'm glad he came here. You know, I'm glad he gave us a chance to help him. I, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. It was nothing, really, just nothing. But I, I, I thought of that when you were saying it. People, if the guy's been on the road three or four days, he doesn't smell good. If he's down that low and and it's hard to, uh, you know, hard for him to take care of himself and what have you, then yeah, he's gonna. And another thing, uh, I remember Kenneth used to say, the easy things to help nobody, you'll never make a mistake if you don't help anybody, except that's a mistake. But uh, you know, to conclude that. Well, they made bad choices. Well, of course they made bad choices. That's why they're in jail, or that's why you know some of these things are happened have happened to them. Um, anybody here ever made a bad choice? And I'm not minimizing the bad choice. I'm just saying you you can't use as a criterion. Well, if you've done everything perfect in your whole life, then we'll help you. You can count on us. You see, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost, that which was broke, that was, was, as they'd say, where I'm from, toe up, you know. That's who he was after, as well as the people that didn't think they needed anyone. And so uh, 
He did. And here in chapter 8, we're going to talk about these, uh, a little bit these ministering women. They're women that Jesus healed who continued to support his ministry. Uh, uh, I mean, all the way. Who was at the cross? Women. John was the only the, the disciple that Jesus loved. I think it was John was there, but everybody else was in the wind because they knew the law was after them, you know. But the women were there. Um, how in all four gospels, who knows how many of the women uh, resisted and or were negative toward the Christ? I don't, well, I don't believe there were any, were there? None. If it is, I don't know who I don't know who that would be. It, it's always in a positive light, and so there are gender specific roles that God created that must be respected. But part of the problem that we've run into, I think, in recent times, is disrespecting the very honored role that God gave to the women and the contribution that they have always made from the time the Lord was here straight through uh, to keep it going. Uh, I remember Brother John Hollinsworth was a very dignified man. He ran the honors program at, Hardy, at uh, Fried Hardman University when I was there. And, and uh, Brother Hollinsworth, when I was preaching in Adamsville, he said, oh, I preached there in some of my early days. And he said there was uh, four women... And uh, um, Jean uh, Hall was there with little, two little snotty-nosed kids, and that was about it. Well, it was a good congregation uh, when we were there, and it had a nice building and all that. But the, his point was four women started to work, and he came over there and preached. And they got, they got on a roll uh, and uh, were successful. That had been many years ago, but... Uh, and so you've seen that down through, uh, through time. Uh, one of the early assignments I got is a young guy was, uh, I got asked to teach a, a Bible class at VBS for the adults. And it was a daytime VBS. So you know who was in there? Those old sisters that wore gloves to church, you know, carried them big old purses and what have you. I mean, they'd forgot more Bible than than any two or three of us probably will ever know. But they were so kind to a struggling young preacher, you know. I mean, it was a, it turned out to be a good week, but when I got there and saw who was there, I thought, oh, no. You know, <laughs> uh, how, what am I going to teach these people? Uh, but they were very supportive and all of that, because that was who was there. There wasn't any guys there. They were all at work and, and, uh, and here and there and young. And so we're going to see, and, and Luke is always careful to bring some of those things out. You'll see in the first half of the chapter, uh, the Lord above all and, and as the bearer of glad tidings of the kingdom. And we're going to know he who, who knew beforehand that his words would have different effects on different people. We'll see that in verses 4 through 15. But who nonetheless commanded that the light of the gospel should shine, verses 16 to 17. He knew not everybody was going to accept it, but preach it to them anyway. Let them make the decision. Um, I know it's kind of a different thing, but yet the same. Let them make the decision. The fellow that taught uh, a class on firearms uh, said one time, you know, if you have to ever use deadly force as a person licensed to carry a firearm, you need to be able to go home knowing it was that other guy's decision, that he made the decision. He's the one that brought the violence and, and, and that you weren't the guy that did. And the point he made very poignantly was, he said, you take it from me, you got to live with what you do. You got to carry it. And so... Uh, I'm going to resist saying something that might be construed political. But anyway, um, we do indeed need to uh, preach the gospel. If people reject it, we can know that we've preached the gospel to them. These first three verses, soon afterwards he began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him 
and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who has called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joshua, uh, no, sorry, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who were contributing to their support out of their private means. And so we'll leave it there next time. Thank you very much. God bless you.